I am Nigel, aka Sleepy Fox, and uh, I work for SourceSense, an open source uh, consultancy. And I'm here to talk about uh, software metrics. Ooh, what's that? You cannot imagine the power of dark side. <laughs> so I'm going to look at software metrics from a slightly different perspective than usual and talk about why software metrics haven't actually turned out or produced benefits that we thought they might have done 20 years ago when they seemed to be a kind of panacea. Um, now lots of us are familiar with metrics, um, function point analysis, constructive cost modeling, McCabe cycle metric complexity. There's tons of them out there. And uh, Tom DeMarco is famous for all those years ago quoting uh, Lord Kelvin and saying, you cannot measure what you cannot control. No, you can't control what we cannot measure, and therefore you must measure everything. And um, let's look at this. Um, quick straw poll, how many people around the room? Hands up uh, if you still have to deal with Gantt charts. No? Nobody has to deal with Jane? Well, lucky you. Um, this is still uh, the default way of managing projects in government IT. Um, anything in the public sector, fixed cost, fixed price, traditional project planning. Um, so, uh, the plan is a lie. Um, we all know it's a lie. Um, hands up, who does Agile? Uh, pretty much everyone. Okay. So, Churchill says failing to plan is planning to fail, um, but uh, other people have said no plan of battle survives the first engagement, or alternatively, uh, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. We all know that when we begin a project, um, the plan that is produced is based on incorrect information. And yet still, people do it. Um, and the reason is that they have money, and they're budget holders, and they want to know how best to spend that money, and therefore they have to make some decisions. And this is all based around our good old friend, cost accounting. We have to make some value decisions about where the money is going to go. Now, if we were agile, perhaps we would budget more often than once a year. Um, so it's all about the money. Um, but we can't tell up front how much software is going to cost. So we work on cost being proportional to effort, which is proportional to complexity and therefore we estimate complexity instead of cost, um, assuming that there is a linear relation between the two. Um, and complexity usually is modelled as being equivalent to some components, and we measure proxies for this, and they are requirements or features of stories or mandates or ideal mandates or story points. Um, and this is all about trying to get a handle on what the complexity is of the software that we're going to produce. Um, and I put psychomatic complexity in italics because it's a trailing measure rather than a leading measure, um, because you have to have the code before you can measure it. So the problems with the measures, um, granularity, so stuff like requirements or stories, um, they're of differing granularity. And therefore, this is why we deal with story points, to solve that problem, so that we measure in things in the same units. But unfortunately, we have an interrater reliability problem because no one point story is your three point story or vice versa. <coughs> um, because story points are a relative measure. There is also the problem of the measurement effect. The act of measuring the system changes it. And this can have some very subtle effects. Um, if you tell a team that they have a week to get something done, and then you ask them, how long do you think it will take? Chances are they'll say a week. Finally, there are lots of different kinds of bias that people experience as part of estimation and reasoning about an experiment. Um, if you look on Wikipedia, there are 56 different kinds of bias. Um, so that's an awful lot of thinking to do uh, if you're designing an experiment, if you want to figure out how your process is working. So if all of this if this is so flawed, why do managers do it? Well, Maslow, as in famous Maslow's hierarchy of needs, said uh, if you only have, if the only tool you have is a hammer, then every problem begins to look like a nail. 
And this is a fundamental part of management thinking. So in the old days, we had something called the Peter Principle. And the Peter Principle was basically that you started off at the bottom of an organization, and if you did a good job, you got promoted. And eventually, you got promoted into management. And um, you kept being promoted until you stopped doing a good job, and then you weren't promoted anymore. So basically, anybody in middle management was incompetent. Um, these days, uh, management works slightly differently, and Scott Adams has uh, come up with a new term for it, which he calls the Dilbert Principle, which is that um, if you can build stuff, you go into engineering, um, and if you've got, uh, if you can talk to people and convince them, you go into sales or marketing, and if you have really good hair, you go into management, where you can do the least damage. This hasn't unfortunately turned out to be the winning strategy um, that we thought it would be. Um, and the underlying philosophy is that um, if you can manage one kind of business, you can manage any kind of business. And this thinking is pervasive in modern management theory. Uh, and this is a legacy of Taylorism. Um, Frederick Winslow Taylor, um, author of The Principles of Scientific Management, published in 1911, um, he basically said, management knows best. Uh, if you're doing the work, you basically really don't understand what's going on. Um, and this has, has had a pervasive effect on the way that management treats employees ever since Victorian Britain turned from a cottage industry of craftsmen into fa uh, modern factory work, equivalent to what they call the dark satanic mills. Um, we know that software is inherently unpredictable. Standish report, the latest of their chaos reports on software project success, this is, the figures vary depending on whether you're looking at packaged software or application development or um, technology re-engineering. The application development, which is what most of us do, only 4% of those succeeded. 47% were challenged, which means they didn't arrive on time or on budget. Um, so, without domain knowledge, because managing any domain is the same as managing any other domain, uh, managers value data over information, facts over professionals' opinions because they know best, processes over individuals, following a plan over responding to change, uh, contract negotiation, negotiation over <coughs> customer collaboration. And the end result of this is that I believe traditional management is no longer competent to actually manage the software development process. Software is often described as being like science. I don't believe it is like science, because in science you have a scientific method, and you can design experiments, and you can reason, and because the experiments are reproducible, you can verify other people's results. And unfortunately, you can't do that in software, because the moment you conduct an experiment, the people who have engaged in that experiment have changed. People, because of their knowledge, skills, and abilities, are different from other people. Unless no two experiments are alike. We talk about it being like engineering, but engineering is based on the properties of materials, and those properties are constant and do not change. Software is not like that. We talk about software being like manufacturing, but manufacturing is about the assembly of components. Lots and lots and lots of components all alike. They're always the same. But we don't do that. All of the assembly that we do in software is done by compilers and linkers and other automated means. All we do in software is design. <coughs> and thus, our metaphor, or these metaphors, are double-edged swords. Um, they cut the people who use them. And they have pernicious side effects. When we talk about software factories, is producing software like working in a factory? No, it isn't. Um, if it isn't like these things, what is it like? Well, Frederick Brooks in No Silver Bullets back in 1986 made the argument that software is not like anything else we have experienced before. And he looks at four different things, complexity, conformity, changeability, and invisibility, and says this is why they're different. Complexity, no two things are alike in software, and as a consequence, software is more complex than any other field. Conformity, software does not conform to natural laws. Um, it is arbitrary and constrained by existing business or systems that we have to adapt to. Um, it is changeable. Uh, in manufacturing, we do not 
change things after we've manufactured them. We might make revisions to a new version of the product, but we don't hopefully do recalls. Um, and it's invisible. So much of architecture or engineering is amenable to two-dimensional representation, engineering drawings, architects' plans, circuit diagrams. Software is not very amenable to this. It is not very visualizable, and as such, it makes it very difficult to deal with. Now, in conclusion, um, and this is a bit of a tough one, um, Gödel's completeness theorem states that Gödel was a famous um, philosopher and mathematician, um, stated where well, he proved that no system of mathematics is complete, because for any system of mathematics it is capable of describing problems which that system cannot solve. And he proved that this was true for any system of mathematics. Now, some uh, rather brainy Russian and Polish people um, proved that in actual fact the same thing holds true for software complexity. And the, the conclusion of this is that it is impossible, not difficult, impossible to accurately estimate software above a certain trivial level of complexity. So the conclusion is complexity and hence reliability and therefore cost for all are fundamentally impossible to predict with precision. And this has huge cascading effects on the way that we manage software. So software engineering is not difficult, it is insoluble. This is why we always feel that it's so difficult. And this is why we've moved from predictive to a reactive model in developing software. This is why we have our job, because it is the only rational course of action. So, software metrics. Whenever you see software metrics, you must be mindful of the power of the dark side.